Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tech First. My name is John Gutz here. I have a super special and short episode for you today. We're chatting with Gordon Wilson. He's the CEO of Rain AI, which they're building a brain. It's neuromorphic computing. They're building a brain. Now, there is a challenge here. I'm actually talking to him while he's on his way out just before the Christmas break to go on vacation. He's in an airport lounge in SFO, San Francisco, and the audio is not great. So I'm going to put text on screen. If you're listening on the podcast, it is possible to make it out, but it might just kill you. So <laughs> go to YouTube, subscribe on YouTube. This is not a ploy to get you sub to subscribe on YouTube, but if you do, great. Uh, listen to it there, watch it there, uh, and you'll have the words on screen. It won't be perfect because it is a machine translation, and guess what? Uh, machines aren't perfect yet, but it is amazing. We're talking about the cost of AI, the cost of running things like chat, GPT, and the fact that our brains are still one million times more efficient. Enjoy. We're seeing miracles daily. Generative AI is kind of in a golden age. We see images that startle us from stable diffusion, text that looks almost human written from chat GPT, video from other tools, 3D cloud points from Dolly just announced yesterday. But what's the computational cost of all this magic? Rain Neuromorphic makes an artificial brain. It's an analog computer. It's 10,000 times more efficient than some machine learning algorithms on NVIDIA GPUs. Is analog the future of AI? Welcome, Gordon. Thank you so much for having me here, John. Always a pleasure chatting with you. Always a pleasure. Thank you for taking time. Where in the world are you? You're in an airport lounge, is that correct? I am. I'm at SFO. I'm on my way down to Los Angeles for tonight and then to Costa Rica, where I'll be spending a week. Uh, but it seems I can't fully disconnect ever and bring my work with me. And um, but excited to have a little bit of tropical warmth uh, over the winter. Excellent. Okay, so we got some background noise. We'll take care of that later in post-production, hopefully. No worries whatsoever. Um, let's start here. Performance costs of AI. Uh, we've heard from OpenAI, for instance, that eventually they'll have to start charging for chat GPT. They said the, the, the bills are astronomical. Uh, what are the costs here? We're talking to run chat GPT. It's on the order of millions of dollars a day. You know, and similar models. I mean, you mentioned that we are in this golden age, this of generative AI just over these last few months, you know, between Dolly 2 and ChatGPT and the stable diffusion. You know, these are models that are incredible and they're capturing our imagination, but they are staggeringly expensive. You know, this, the costs here are, you know, primarily it's, it's data center compute. You know, you have racks and racks of GPUs and CPUs that are used to train neural networks to run these types of models and to create these types of, you know, dreamy uh, landscapes or visuals or stories. But of course, this is extraordinary. I mean, as you mentioned, and the, the costs are, are massive. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, the costs are extraordinarily high because, well, I, I think perhaps we should have a metric of comparison, right? They're, they're expensive compared to what, right? This is brilliant. This is magical. Like, it might be worthwhile to run, spend $3 million a day to run ChatGPT, but what is the metric of comparison, right? So for us at Rain, the metric of comparison for the cost of artificial intelligence is the cost of intelligence, right? The cost of biology. And for our brain, we don't require being plugged in to you know, a data center where the compute to draw something. We don't require megawatts of energy to write an essay on our own. We're still on the order of a million times more expensive to run digital AI, deep learning, things that Stable Fusion, ChatGPT, um, and Dolly 2 were all built upon. We're about 1 million X in cost between uh, that extraordinary AI today that we see now and what we know the brain is capable of. So, Interesting. So just make sure that I got that. You think you're a million times more efficient at running those AI models than what we got right now. Is that correct? Our, our brain is a million times more efficient, to clarify. 
That is the metric of humans. I thought the brain you were talking about was the rain AI brain, but <laughs> you're talking oh, about <laughs> wetware. <laughs> wetware. But so because that's the comparison, that's the North Star, right? That guides us at rain. You know, we're trying to take clues from what the brain has achieved and then build that into hardware. So what we have demonstrated at rain, you know, is moving towards that direction. You know, we have, I think we just had recently published uh, an article in Nature Electronics, which was a demonstration of this new flavor of very brain-like algorithms mm -hmm. working on also a new type of hardware. And these are mem resistors. Mm -hmm. and, and this allows you, in this paper, we were projecting between 10,000 and 100,000 X greater energy efficiency than for training the equivalent models with backpropagation on graphics processing units, or GPUs. So there's a lot of numbers I throw out there. You know, the 10,000, 100,000 X is our major electronics. But the 1 million X remains that gap between artificial intelligence today and biological intelligence. One begins to understand why in the matrix, the um, AIs plugged in human brains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're extraordinary machines and extraordinarily efficient, especially at what they can, at the, what they can do. You know, it's, it's the, I always like to talk about scale and efficiency, right? The brain has achieved both. And typically when we're looking at compute platforms, we have to, choose you know do we either want the scale of compute that can support the creativity that we see in stable diffusion or do we want something efficient enough that we can deploy it onto our cell phone without communicating to the cloud and right now that's the dilemma that we have with ai hardware and ai platforms that we either can choose this massive in robust scale but it requires data centers worth of compute or we can deploy little models very very compact models and usually only inference to the edge and that's a trade-off we don't want to have to keep making right let's take a step backward talk about what rain ai is building uh, and where you are right now how it's different uh, and what you're doing that is going to be so much more efficient absolutely so i can start with we are building artificial brains and we call ourselves the Artificial Brain Company. Um, it's kind of our new tagline we're going with. And what is an artificial brain? Well, we compare it to also a brain. A brain is a platform that supports intelligence. And a brain, a biological brain, is hardware and software and algorithms all blended together in a very deeply intertwined way. An artificial brain, like what we're building at Ray, is also hardware plus algorithms plus software co-designed, intertwined in a way that is really like, we can't inseparable. You know, the, the, the computers that we've been using for the last 60 years are von Neumann machines. And they were built off of the fundamental separation of memory and processing, but also ultimately the separation of hardware and software mm -hmm. that you can build a program, write a program, and that program the memory of that program can survive the hardware dying. And the brain is not like that. Biology is not like that. Unfortunately. No <laughs> Unfortunately not. Certainly not yet. And, and because there's no, there's no separation, right, between hardware and software as we define, as we see it in intelligence. And, and so an artificial brain, also, you have to make that trade-off. You have to combine hardware and software, co-design them together. A phrase that I really love from Dr. Katie Schumann at uh, Oak Ridge is radical co-design. She's a leading neuromorphic researcher. You have to radically co-design hardware and software and algorithms together to be able to achieve these types of multiple order of magnitude gains, which are the kind that we demonstrated in nature electronics. Now, historically, the challenge with designing hardware and software together and building them together has been that you built something that was purpose built. You built something that was could do one thing or maybe two things, but it wasn't general purpose. Now our brains, which you're modeling after, are exactly what you're talking about, but they're very general purpose. I mean, we can do art, we can do higher mathematics, we can uh, waste time on a mobile game, <laughs> we can do a lot of different things. What is your artificial brain going to be capable of? So on the long time horizon, our roadmap is to ultimately build a general purpose artificial brain. In the near term, we'll be building for more specific applications because we can't solve for every use case all at once. But the brain, again, gives us proof that there is this in evolutionary time, very new portion of the brain, which is the neocortex. 
And it has the same structure repeated across with it, which are these about 11 layers and these, these tall cortical columns. And the neocortex somehow, even though it's the same structure, supports vastly different types of intelligence. It supports vision, it supports hearing, it supports natural language and higher order reasoning. So that is evidence enough for us that we know there is an architecture that is general purpose. It already exists from biology, but for us initially, our brains will not be solving every problem, but they, but all of the brains that we are building critically are going to enable efficient learning. So why efficient learning, right? Well, I think that's, first of all, that's true of all biological brains as well. They can all learn, they can all adapt, and they can all do so with such low power they can fit inside of an animal body. So this goes back to the trade-off I was, I was saying that we face today with our options for hardware. People either have the option of vast scale in a data center with racks of GPUs, or they have the option for efficiency and for deployment of very small models. And that deployment is limited to inference. And inference is not learning. It's not training. The learning portion of it is so expensive that it's stuck in data centers. So the problem that we're solving is this question of efficient learning. How can we make training so cheap and so efficient that you can push that all the way to the edge? Because if you can do that, then I think that's what really encapsulates the artificial brain. It is a, it's a device, it's a piece of hardware and software that can exist and untether, perhaps in a cell phone or AirPods or a robot or a drone. And it importantly has the ability to learn on the fly, to adapt to a changing environment or a changing self. Remember we chatted about that last time, but that, that is a critical requirement of all artificial brains that are on our roadmap, that they all have this ability to learn. I'm, I'm just, I'm just sitting here right now and I'm kind of laughing inside because you're, you're in a, a public lounge <laughs> in the airport and you're talking about artificial brains and I'm wondering who's listening, who's hearing that and wondering, oh, we've got Dr. Frankenstein here <laughs> flying out of SFO, <laughs> hopefully not too many people. Okay. So you're building something very cool and super ambitious. Uh, when can a company like OpenAI come to you and say, hey, uh, give us 10,000. Uh, we want to plug them in on the back end. So that's still a few years out. So unfortunately, it's, um, or fortunately, rather, it just, it takes time to build something that's this radically different and that's this much better. And initially, we intend to support intelligence in new places where no one else is providing a solution as opposed to kind of going to market to compete directly with NVIDIA. You know, we... You know, our solution is really offering something brand new in the building. You'll be able to push training again to these edge locations. So there are a lot of interesting use cases that we're going to be tackling in the near term, which are, say, in industrial manufacturing or in robotics. And you have um, a machine that wants to learn on the fly is maybe adapting to a changing environment. There are changing conditions or the degradation of that machine. And that's where we're going to be plugging that in first. But to get to you know, 10,000 uh, unit orders, 100,000 unit orders for OpenAI, we're still a, a few years away from that. Super interesting. I see so much potential for that. Uh, we, we keep talking about healthcare with aging populations, whether that's Japan, whether that's the United States, whether that's Europe or anything like that. But you need smart help and we don't have the people for it. I mean, even a dog will be smart and adapt to its its uh, companion, its owner, right? And and having machines like that that can help people as well is great. Super interesting. I know you've got to fly. You're heading off for Christmas. Um, thank you so much for taking this time. Is there anything else that you wanted to hit us with? There are a few more just quick updates I wanted to give, share with you all. So, you know, we have been on this approach for... Um, to building neural morphic hardware and on this path building artificial brains for a long time. This is our sixth year at Rain. And, you know, for a long time, I think we've been quite contrarian. But in the past few months, you know, there have been a few moments of, I think, that in the broader conversation that are worth mentioning. So, Jeff Hinton, you're probably familiar, familiar with, he's one of the godfathers of deep learning. Uh, he works at Google right now. He gave the closing keynote at NeurIPS, which is the largest machine learning conference in the world, one of the largest. And in that talk, he spoke about the need for a new substrate of hardware, for something that's cheaper, that's more efficient. And he mentioned analog and neuromorphic. And 
I used a term that I'd never heard before, which is what he coined, called mortal computation. And that was the idea that we have to give up immortality, right? We have to give up the idea that, you know, we can save software, we can save the memory of the system after the hardware dies. So he was actually talking about this blending of hardware and software that we uh, build at Rain. And what was really cool is that he released this paper of a new algorithm called the forward forward algorithm, which should be compliant with new hardware. And then in the paper that we looked at, I think that same day, there was one reference to hardware that it could be compatible with. And that was our work for 2020 with the Oh, So I was very pleased we're beginning, you know, exploring this collaboration with Jeff, but to see him validate our approach, validate this need for a new substrate for compute and to move in the direction of neuromorphic and analog it was very, very exciting to see. Mortal computing. Um, it just brings up so many possibilities. Uh, machines with personalities, machines that become more than they are when they ship, machines that adapt to you and become part. I mean, wow. Um, you start thinking about uh, life and artificial life, and we can get very, very deep into that. I know you got to fly. Thank you so much for taking the time. Appreciate it. Jim. Thank you so much.